I want to speak to you today about seeing the invisible. Moses saw him who is invisible. Seeing the invisible, that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but it's not. Everything you see is only a tiny fraction of what exists. Most of life is invisible. In primitive times, what could not be seen was judged not to exist. But as science progressed, scientists were able to prove that things that were previously invisible existed. So in 1674, a Dutch scientist made a kind of like a homemade microscope. And with this microscope, he looked at a drop of lake water. And he saw things that no one had ever discovered before. An invisible world that no one knew existed. He was the first to discover bacteria, sperm cells, blood cells, muscle fibers, and much more. Well, then you could look at the sky. And when we look at the sky at night, on a clear night, we see, we see the stars. But actually, that's only a fraction of the stars that exist. A tiny, tiny fraction of the billions and billions of stars, some of which no one has seen. But even with the most powerful microscope and the most powerful telescope in the world, there are still things that would be invisible. One of our speakers at Focus this year is the brilliant academic from Oxford, Amy Or Ewing. She was also uh, spoke at Focus last year. And when she was speaking at Focus last year, she told us about her, her twins. She has nine-year-old twins. And uh, she was driving them to a tennis tournament the other side of the, uh, the country, and they were in conversation. And these nine-year-olds began to describe something that happened to them at school. Zach, who was sitting in the front, nine-year-old Zach, said, oh, yes, mummy. We were talking to so-and-so, and he told us, only stupid people believe in God because only stupid people believe in things they can't see. So Amy said, well, what did you say? He said, well, I, I said, can you see my thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> so Amy asked, well, what did your friend say? He said, no, but still, you can't see God so why should you believe in him? At this point, the other twin in the back piped up, yeah, the guy's so mean, he knows we love Jesus. <laughs> so Amy said, well, what did you say? He said, oh, mummy, don't worry. We told them all about the fine-tuning of the universe and how the fundamental concepts underpinning life are so finely tuned that they couldn't come about by chance. The complexity of the universe itself points to a designer. <laughs> Plus, we know God is real because we met him at Focus. <laughs> they were right. Thoughts are invisible. But we know they exist. Love is invisible. But we know it exists. God is invisible. But we know he exists. And he loves you. And the writer of Hebrews says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. There's plenty of evidence for the existence of God. That's what we're going to be looking at on Alpha on Wednesday. If you've never done Alpha, come and join. Hear the evidence for the existence of God this Wednesday on Alpha. So much evidence you can be sure. In fact, you can be certain about what you cannot see but it's invisible. We live by faith, Paul writes, not by sight. And your faith pleases God. That's what this passage in Hebrews says. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And that includes you. You have pleased God today. 
by coming here. You've exercised faith by coming here today. And he will reward you. He lists some of the heroes of faith. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph, and Moses. And all of them, he says, are like you. They're looking in the right direction. They're all people of faith. Their eyes are in the right place. They're not living like those around in the world. They're looking in the right direction. They're living by a different narrative. We're marching to a different tune. And he gives the example here of Moses, the supreme figure in the Old Testament, preeminently a man of faith. And we see here three aspects of Moses' faith. He chose the imperishable, he saw the invisible, and he accomplished the impossible. You may be facing right now an impossible situation, a seemingly impossible situation in your life, perhaps in your health, or the health of a family member or friend. Perhaps you're facing a seemingly impossible situation in your business, or in a relationship, in a marriage, or a family situation, or at school or university. Look at the our vision here, it's seemingly impossible. The evangelization of this nation, the revitalization of the church, the transformation of our society. How, how, can we, how can this be accomplished? What can we learn from Moses? Here's the first thing. Choose the imperishable. So many people seek after these three things, perishable things, money, sex, and power. Look at Moses. He was brought up in the Egyptian royal ha household. He was the son of the adopted grandson of Pharaoh. All the treasures of Egypt were at his disposal. He could have been richer than Bill Gates, richer than Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg. All the pleasures of the royal palace would have been at his disposal, as many beautiful wives and mistresses as he wanted. He had the prospect of gaining the throne of Egypt, the most powerful throne of the day. Indeed, he would have been more powerful than the President of the United States. He could have had money, sex, and power in abundance. But instead, he chose the imperishable. Why did he choose the imperishable? The writer of Hebrews tells us why. Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose, he chose the imperishable. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. As some translations put it, the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. This is in the Old Testament. He, he, he saw Jesus for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead. He was looking in the right direction. His eyes were fixed to his reward. He realized the things that you see become your enemy if they prevent you from seeing the imperishable things. And he said no to the fleeting pleasures of sin, no to the treasures of Egypt. He chose instead to be ill-treated along with the people of God. And the writer of Hebrew applies this to us, and he says, you fix your eyes on Jesus. And this is one definition of faith, is forsaking all. I take him. Forsaking all perishable things, I take him. Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus. That's what I did. At the age of 18, I was an atheist. And I chose at that moment. I knew I had a choice. That was an initial step of faith. That's the step of faith you've taken. But it's also a step of faith you have to take every day. When I first started leading Alpha, uh, it was back in October 1990. It was the first course I had responsibility for leading. And at that stage, it was a course 
designed for new Christians. It took place down in the spring. But what happened on that course was about week five. There was a guy who was helping on the course called Eric Kastenskill. And Eric said, I'm bringing my non-Christian friend tonight to Alpha. And uh, he described this friend of his. They'd been at Cambridge together. And he said, my friend Matthew, who's not a Christian, he rowed for the university for two years. He's a, got a double blue in rowing. He is six foot four. He weighs 14 and a half stone. He's a very good looking guy. And he's very interested in the girls on Alpha. And he said he's, he's heard that there's some very attractive young women on the Alpha course, and he's come to have a look round. And to be honest, he said that's the only reason he's coming to Alpha. And because we met down in the spring, I don't know if you know that room down there, it's kind of like a little amphitheater. It's a great place to take a look round. <laughs> so Matthew came, and uh, during the talk, he was taking a look round. But he said he was not going to stay for the small group. So I did something a little bit naughty. It's not something that I recommend. But during the coffee break, I introduced him to one of the most attractive young women <laughs> on Alpha. And Matthew changed his mind. He decided he would stay for the small group. <laughs> and he joined her small group. And he completed the course. And he encountered Jesus. And his life was radically changed. And then he married my wife Pippa's younger sister, Sam. So he's now my brother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> so a year ago to the day, Matthew was on a bike ride. He's, he's part of a cy cycling club. And as he was biking along, he had a massive um, heart attack, I guess you call it. He had a cardiac arrest. His heart stopped. And he flew off his bike in front of the car coming towards him, landed on his head, cracked his skull in two places, and his heart had stopped dead. Someone on the uh, team was someone who had sort of experience in first aid, or they never practiced it, and he tried to resuscitate him. But at that moment, there was a car passing the other way, driven by a consultant anaesthetist, and he got out of the car, and he organized things. And within 12 minutes, the uh, paramedics had arrived. Within 17 minutes, an air ambulance had arrived. And within one hour, they'd got a stent into his heart. But it didn't look good. Uh, Sam went to the hospital. The consultant cardiologist said, I can tell you from my experience, these situations never turn out well. But Sam got everybody praying. They had a, like prayer warriors all over the country praying for him. And after five days, he squeezed her hand. And they, they knew there was life there. And one year later, he has made the most remarkable, one year to the day this is today, he's made the most remarkable recovery. In fact, he's here today. But you know something, we've been talking, they're staying with us this weekend, we've been talking, he's a changed man. Because his whole values have changed, he says. So before, he was so focused on perishable things, his business, his sport, whatever it was. Now, he says, he is focused on his relationship with God. He said, during that time, what he experienced was Jesus holding him. And he knew that he was loved. He said it was like a parent picking up a child and holding them. And he knew God was real. And one of the things he says now is, I don't fear death. It's that fact he said, I'm really looking forward to it. It's amazing. I don't think his family are looking forward to it. But he is because he, he, he says, and now I know it's real. Before I used to have doubts about, about whether it was real. But now he's seen the invisible world. He knows it's true. And he's desperate that all his friends should know that it's true. And he says, he describes his, his life being like a tower. 
And uh, I hope I can draw this um, how he would draw it. But he says his life is like a tower like this. And at the top of the tower is God. And then, then his wife, Sam. And then his children and his friends and the relationships. And out of it, there are like three guy ropes, which are his work, his business, his non-business activities, his sport. And he says the difference is before, if these things, he'd do these things anyway, whether it interfered with this or not. Now, he only does these things provided it doesn't interfere with this, because this is his number one priority. So, going for a five-hour bike ride, which he still does, now he'll only do it if it is going to enhance this. But if it's going to detract from this, he won't do it. If his business is going to detract from God and his relationship. These are imperishable things. Your relationship with God, your relationship with your family, your, these are imperishable. These are perishable. And the perishable should never stop us seeing the imperishable. And that's what he has discovered. That's what he's learned through this extraordinary experience that he's been through in the last year. And he says right now he walks with the Lord day in, day out, hour in, hour out, much closer and deeper than ever before because he's seen the invisible. He's, he, has, he has chosen the imperishable. And the fact that you are here right now, today, in Onslow Square, in Courtfield Gardens, the fact that you're here at Brompton Road means you too have done the same thing. You could have been, you could have treated this like another work day. You could be shopping. You could be just lying in after a heavy night the night before. You could be watching a box set of Game of Thrones. You could be doing anything, but you have chosen the imperishable. When you sign in for Focus Week, <laughs> instead of going to a Greek island for a week, <laughs> you're choosing the imperishable. When you help at the homeless shelter, we were at the homeless shelter this week, amazing group of volunteers, including some who are here, I can see right now, you're choosing the imperishable when you help an ex-offenders. When, when you give a day of your week to going to Alpha or a Connect group or the marriage course, you're choosing the imperishable. When you take out a standing order to support the people of God, you are choosing the imperishable. And when you get up early to pray, to read the Bible, you are choosing the imperishable. And Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room and pray to your Father who is in heaven. And your Father who is in heaven will reward you. And what we're told here is that Moses was looking ahead for his reward. There's a future reward that Peter tells us will never perish, spoil or fade, and it's kept in heaven for you. Moses is still receiving his reward. We read in the New Testament that the disciples saw him. He met with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses is still alive. He's still alive now. He's enjoying his reward with Jesus in heaven for eternity. But you don't have to wait to receive your reward. You can receive your reward right now in your relationship with Jesus that will satisfy you in a way that the fleeting pleasures of sin will never satisfy. As you pray, God will reward you with his presence, with his love that will satisfy your soul. Choose the imperishable. See the invisible. By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. 
he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. I don't know whether you have anyone in your life or anything that causes you to fear. Maybe it's a boss, a teacher, a friend, someone in your peer group. Moses had plenty to fear. He was taking on the most powerful ruler of the day. Pharaoh was the king. But it says, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Moses disdained the anger of the king he could see in order to please the king he could not see. And this is another definition of faith. So the first definition of faith, first type of faith is forsaking all I take in. That's initial faith. Then here's another definition of faith. Feeling afraid. I trust him. Faith is trust in a person. And because of that faith, he left Egypt twice. First, as a fleeing criminal. It's encouraging in a way to think that Moses had messed up in his life. All of us mess up in our life. Maybe you look back at your life and say, God will never have anything to do with me. I've really messed up. I messed up my marriage. I messed up my job. I messed up this relationship. I messed up this. Yeah, Moses messed up too. We've, I've messed up. Everybody's messed up. But God didn't write him off just because he'd messed up. He left Egypt twice, once as a fleeing criminal and then as leader of God's people. And in between, he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. He persevered. I have a friend, maybe at Courtfield Gardens today, who's a, a businessman, and he, he, he told me this. He said, in his business, when he's employing someone, the question he, the thing he's looking for before he employs anyone is resilience. And he always asks this question. He says it's quite a, a, a penetrating question to ask, quite a personal question to ask. But he always asks them, because he's looking for this quality of perseverance, resistance, what is the hardest thing you've ever had to face in your life? And for me, the answer to that question would be the death of my close friend, Mick Hawkins, uh, 21 years ago, on the squash court. I was playing squash with him, father of six children. He died of a heart attack in front of me, and I couldn't rescue him. And my prayers for him were not answered. And I don't know to this day, I will never know, I don't think this side of heaven, why God saved Matthew, but he didn't save Mick. And there may be things in your life you say, I just don't know why God allowed this to happen to me. That night I can remember so well, because I, I, of course I couldn't sleep. Five o'clock in the morning, I went out and I, I walked and I prayed and I just said to God, God, I don't understand why this is happening, but I am not going to stop believing in you. Now, that was the hardest thing that's happened in my life. But think how much harder it was for Mick Hawkins' wife, Zilla, and for his six children. Youngest was six at the time. But you know what? In the last 21 years, I have watched them persevere, seeing him who is invisible. And as I look at their faith, persevering, they're all of them, all those, Zilla shines like a bright light, and all of those six children, one or two of them may be here today listening to this, but you shine like a bright light because you're all looking to him who is invisible, seeing him who is invisible, persevering in faith, feeling afraid, I trust him. That is persevering faith. And some of you right now, 
the words of the writer of Hebrew apply to you. He says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Many of you at uh, Onso Square, Courtfield Gardens, I know you have run this race with perseverance for many years. Mountain tops inspire us, but valleys mature us. And some of you are in a valley right now in your business, with your health, maybe in your relationships, and you don't understand what's going on. Fix your eyes on Jesus. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. See the invisible. Your faith pleases God, and he will reward you. And those who choose the imperishable and see the invisible will accomplish the impossible, what seems impossible. Your life has a purpose, but only when you see the invisible can you achieve what is, humanly speaking, impossible. By faith, the people passed through the sea on dry land. Only faith is both a, both a fruit of the Spirit and a gift of the Spirit. And Moses had both the fruit of the Spirit, faith, and also the gift of the Spirit, faith. So, we've looked at, here was the first, the first mnemonic, forsaking all, I take him. Second, that's faith as choice. Second one, feeling afraid, I trust him, faith as perseverance. And this is the third one, faith as expectancy. And this is how that is spelt, R-I-S-K. That's what we looked at last week. That's what Stephen was looking at. I remember Rick Warren saying at the leadership conference a couple of years ago, he says, why does God use me? So the answer is, because I expect him to. That's expectant faith. And that's the faith that Moses had, which enabled him to part the sea. And think about that. This is the expectancy. This is the kind of faith. And we're going to do this in a few minutes at the end of the service. We're going to pray for people here. And what happens is you have a part to play and God has a part to play. We pray for healing. We lay hands on people and God heals them. We lay hands on people and God fills them with the Holy Spirit. Our part is much the easier part. We just stick out our hands. God's part is the hard part, healing them, filling them with the Spirit. Think about Moses. Moses, God says to Moses, stick out your staff and I'm going to part the Red Sea. Think what Moses must have been feeling at that moment. He might have said to God, yes, Lord, I know you can part the Red Sea. I believe you can, but couldn't you just do it? Do you really want to involve me? Just imagine he's got the, the whole of Pharaoh's army bearing down on him and everybody watching. And now he's got to not only believe it in theory, you've got to not only believe in theory that if you lay your hands on someone, they'll be healed or they'll be filled with the Spirit, but then you have to take that step of faith and actually do it. And it was only when he took that step of faith that the sea parted. And it's not the amount of faith that you have that matters. It's not the degree of your faith. It's the object of your faith. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It's a bit like with a parachute. You know, if you had a parachute that has holes in it, doesn't matter how much faith you have in that parachute, it's not gonna work. If you have a good parachute, you only need the tiniest amount of faith, and it will hold. I was chatting to a friend of mine down at the gym a couple of days ago, and he used to be in a parachute regiment. He did 36 jumps. He said this, he said, before you jump, he said every time before he jumped, he was absolutely terrified. But in a few seconds, it turned to absolute exhilaration as the parachute opened and he had this amazing experience. And it's the same when you pray for people. 
When you start praying for people, it's absolutely terrifying. But when you see what God does, it's absolutely exhilarating. And Moses must have felt absolutely terrified. But what happened was absolutely exhilarating. He chose the imperishable, saw the invisible, and accomplished the impossible. And he did it along with a whole lot of other people. And that's what the writer here lists. And he calls them in chapter 12, a great cloud of witnesses surrounding. And you have a great cloud of witnesses surrounding you. Last Monday, Pippa and I went to the football. We went to watch Chelsea at Stamford Bridge. Kind friend invited us. I have supported Chelsea, just to let you know. I have supported Chelsea since I was five years old, but I've only been to see them twice. And this was the second time we've been to see them. And uh, I took a little clip and I put it out on Instagram and here it is. So, so at the football, Chelsea Watford. Here we are. Did you know that Pippa Gumbel was a big Chelsea fan? <laughs> there's Trisha Neal, she's another Chelsea fan. And there's Michael Emmett. Michael Emmett really is a Chelsea fan. And look, wow. This is amazing. The atmosphere in here is astonishing. Oh, look, there's a foul. Got to get back to the game. I, we actually left 15 minutes early, and not because I'm not a great football fan, but because uh, I wanted to get away before all the crowds. So we were on our bikes, and we biked away. It was 3 all when we left. Halfway home, we knew it was 4-3. We heard the cheer of the crowd. The, 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 the sound of the, of the support of those 40,000 football fans in the stadium was amazing. But you could still hear it halfway home when they scored. We absolutely knew it was 4-3 from the roar that went up. And when we got back to the vicarage right here, we could still hear the roar of the crowd, the distant roar. Now what, Paul, what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here is you are surrounded. Like, like can you imagine playing at Stamford Bridge with 45,000 people, that great, great cloud of witnesses cheering you on? What the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, you have a great cloud of witnesses cheering you on. Here's a list of them. And he lists all these people in the Old Testament. And they're still alive. Moses is still alive. You can't see them, but they can see you. And they are cheering you on right now in your battle. In your battle to say no to the fleeting pleasures of sin. In your battle to choose the imperishable. In your battle to see the invisible and accomplish the impossible. This great cloud of witnesses from the Old Testament are cheering you on. Not only are they in the crowd, but also everybody who's died in faith is also part of that great cloud of witnesses. He says at the end of chapter 11, we, every Christian is better off than them. Right now, Mick Hawkins is in heaven cheering us on, cheering on his family on earth. Every person who's died in faith is in that crowd and they are cheering. Right now, it seems like a distant roar like we heard at the vicarage. One day, it'll sound like it sounded in the stadium. It'll be a great roar when we're in that place, when we meet with Jesus, when we see him face to face. But not right now, although you can't see them, they can see you. That's the ones who've died. But they're also the ones still on earth who are cheering you on. Every person who has seen the invisible is cheering you on. Matthew, who's here right now. Matthew, why don't you stand up, turn around. This is my, my brother-in-law, Matthew. Just stay standing, stay standing. This is Matthew, he's cheering you on. Anybody here, stay standing. Anybody here who has been, who sensed that God has healed them supernaturally, who has ever prayed for somebody to be healed supernaturally, would you sta stand up and stay standing? Stand, yeah, keep standing, stand up. If you have been, these are witnesses. If you have been delivered from an addiction, set free, or you prayed for someone to be set free from an addiction, 
or if you have, God has supernaturally supplied a need of your financial need, or you prayed for someone and they have, have, have experienced that. If you have supernaturally experienced someone laying hands on you and being filled with the Holy Spirit, if you've ever been filled with the Spirit, just stand up right now. Stay standing, all of you, stay standing. If you prayed for someone to do that, if you, in any other way you've experienced the invisible God, if you've had an encounter with Jesus, if, if you've fixed your eyes on Jesus, if you've had an experience of the power of the Holy Spirit filling the invisible God, touching your life, stand up right now. Then take a look around. This is the great cloud of witnesses, not just in heaven, but here on earth. And this is the cloud of witnesses that is cheering you on. Stay standing. To, to this, they're cheering you on to choose the imperishable, to see the invisible, and to accomplish the impossible. And as we all do that together, here at Brompton Road, Onso Square, Courtfield Gardens, we will see the, what is seemingly impossible, the evangelization of this nation, the revitalization of the church, and the transformation of society. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Bear Grylls. My favorite way to start the day, the Bible in one year. That's how wild I am. Find out more at BibleInOneYear.org or download the Bible in One Year app.